Hello and welcome to the Jackcast, the Swansea City podcast. I am Gitta Thwilin and with me, as always, we have Steve Carroll and Matt Barocco. Evening, boys. Evening. We've got a packed, packed pod for you tonight. We've got a 4-0 defeat against Burnley, which we unfortunately have to discuss. Uh, thankfully, we've got a 3-2 win against Reading, which was achieved in very dramatic circumstances, which will raise all of our spirits before we get on to the main discussion, the one that we all want to talk about, and that is the big South Wales derby on Sunday against Cardiff. Swansea looking to extend our incredible recent run against the Bluebirds. We'll get on to that later. But first of all, boys, we do have to start off. Chronological order dictates we have to start off with Burnley. Uh, Steve, let's uh, let's start with you. I mean, we'd gone into this game on the back of three consecutive, four, was it four consecutive wins. Uh, spirits were high. We, we knew there was going to be a tough game against one of the best teams in the division, but I think it's fair to say that first half went about as badly as it could have gone. Yeah, um, I think we all knew it was going to be a tough game. Uh, you can't really get away from that, but. Um... Yeah, it, uh, it was men against boys. I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. We were just second best, weren't we? All over the, the pitch, individually poor, poor as a team, gave away cheap goals. And if you do that, then uh, the writing's on the wall, really, isn't it? But um, I mean, you look at it, the first couple of goals were, were quite similar, really, weren't they? Um, you know, all balls to the back post that we didn't deal with. And then we've cocked up with the third goal. Yeah, it's a long way back, isn't it, from there? And it, I think if it carrying half a team as we were on Saturday. I mean, you're going to struggle against anyone, but then obviously when you're up against one of the better sides in the division, you're going to probably be on the wrong end of a, a bit of a hammering and that's what happened, wasn't it? Yeah, Matt, it was a humbling experience. Do you think it was more down to Burnley having a very good day or us having a very bad day? Um, a Burnley a very good side and, and they'll be there or thereabouts at the end of the season. They they're probably the best side we've played this season for my money. Um, and they were uh, clinical, you know, they, they, they punished us and they, they, they stretched us, but we can't get away from the fact that in particular, well, our defense in hall, but in particularly the, the wing backs had an absolute torrid time. Um, they just weren't using their brains. They, they were, they were getting touch tight to the wingers that were far quicker than them. And when the ball was going round, they were having to rugby tackle and grab all the shirts. And I think we had four bookings in the first half or four or five bookings in the first half alone. And you run in a tightrope against players who will continue to run and run and run at you. And rather than being sensible and standing off one or two yards and making them make a decision, we were committing ourselves far too early and making it easy Um it was obviously a combination of a great team versus a team having a really poor day, which is the recipe for disaster. But um, yeah, there's, there's no way those players came in at the end of the game and said we could have done nothing about that because there were whole areas. I mean, even Russell Martin said he got it all wrong. Um, there were whole areas of that game which just screamed, uh, this is one of those days and we need to get this out of our system quickly. Steve, there was a lot of attention, as Matt said there, on the wing-backs after that game. Obviously, it wasn't ideal that Ryan Manning couldn't play. He's been possibly our best player so far this season, uh, certainly one of our best players. We definitely missed him. But what does Saturday's game tell us about Sorinola and Latibodier as wing-backs, in your opinion? Are I mean, Sorinola has received a bit more praise of late because of um, his improvement. But do you think that they're good enough to do a job at this level, in your opinion? Well, I, I've said it numerous times now to do with Lata Baudier. He is not a wing back. Um, I'm not really prepared to criticise him too much because it's obvious that he's not a wing back. It's the manager's fault. He shouldn't be picking him there. Though he's had ample opportunity now across the, the amount of time he's been here. Other people can play there. Finn Stevens has come in from Brentford. Why is he not in the team instead? That is his position. I don't like playing players out of position unless you really have to. We don't need to do it. So Lata Baudier, as much as I don't think he is up to doing the job there, it's not his fault. So the manager really needs to stop picking him there. And if, like I say, if Stevens is available, then at least pick someone that's natural in that position. Um, 
Soren Ola's been a bit hit and miss since he's come in. He's probably improved, but he was poor the other day. I mean, I already alluded to the first two goals. He was in no man's land, really. He didn't look very good there. So he just seems like a player to me that is going to be a bit inconsistent. So I think, if you want my honesty, I'm quite pleased at this stage that it was only a loan rather than a permanent signing because I think, uh, you know, I, I remain to be convinced by him. But look, the fact is where we don't have a lot of other options. Manning was a big loss. And, um, you know, um, if he's playing one player out, out of position there, he's going to, the other one that's a bit more natural sort of has to play, doesn't he? Yeah, I'm I'm with you on Sorinola. I I think the jury is still out. There's been some improvement, which is really encouraging, and he does, you know, do some some good things. But I'm still not entirely convinced that he's up to the standard that we want. And he certainly didn't have a good game along with uh, Latibaudier on the weekend. So, yeah, I want to forget. Although it has to be said, it wasn't. It was certainly not just down to. Our frailties at wing back. It was a team effort, really, and uh, uh, well, many players didn't really turn up. Um, and one player who's not going to be turning up for uh, a couple of games now, Matt, is Joel Piru. The red card. Let, let's get on to it. Are you surprised that the Swans didn't appeal it, or does that tell tell us everything we need to know, really? Um. Well. The replays don't look great, do they? Uh, whether how much contact there was, they you can see, and I don't know if Pirro has denied it publicly or privately. I haven't seen anything, but his movements uh, indicate a stamp. I mean, and, and whether or not there was genuine intent or malice there, you, only he will know. But it, it looks that way, and all the uh, all they're going to do if they review it is is look at the footage that we can all see online, and it looks like a stamp. They're going to laugh it out to court straight away and say thank you very much. Keep keep your three match ban, or maybe even extend it. You know, so uh, I think the club a knew they probably wouldn't get it rescinded, and b um, it's not really right now. Uh, Joel Perot's hotter streak in a Swansea City shirt. I think I'm being kind. Uh, he's not only not scoring like he hasn't been much this season, but now he's actually looking a lot more anonymous than he was earlier in the season. You could say earlier it wasn't quite coming off for him. He was hitting the crossbar, keepers were making good saves, but now he's really struggling to make an impact on games. So um, we made, um, in the podcast last week, uh, We, me and Steve talked about the possibility of Pirro uh, sitting on the bench for a game or two just to get to recharge his batteries and see if the, how the team cope without him as the focal point. Well, now it's been enforced because of this, and uh, we'll see how we cope. You know, we, we as we'll talk about in a bit, we, we, we did well last night um, over the course of the game, and... Um, we got the big one on Sunday and then followed followed up with another big one the week after. So it's crazy three games to miss. But from um, from his perspective and a club's perspective, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world that he's um, that he's not going to be on the pitch for now because clearly something's not quite right at the moment with him. But what about you, Steve? Do you think that this three match ban could actually? benefit Piru in some way obviously none of us would have chosen for him to receive the break this way but do you think there is a chance that he will come back better from this um, I mean, possibly I, I mean the way to look at it is sometimes what you need is if you're off form maybe as a, a bit of a kick up the backside I mean let's be honest every manager probably has their favourites don't they where it doesn't really matter what they do in general they're pretty undroppable and I think it had got to that point a little bit with him where he wasn't playing that great, but he was still playing pretty much every minute. Now, if I'm honest, at 3 nil down and especially 4, I don't really understand why Martin didn't make changes to save people because what I saw was the likes of Unchairman over Fermi going off and I'm not being funny, but it's always those two and they are going to be then swapping with Kundal and Cooper and you're thinking... Well, you're not playing as many minutes then as a lot, the likes of Perot and Grimes, for example. And I was thinking, well, with three and four nil down here, why not save the players that are playing nearly every minute? Now, I'm not sticking up for Perot. What he did was wrong. But I do think that arguably he should have been taken off by then because the game had gone and there was an, a good opportunity just to take him out of the firing line for a, for a little bit. But obviously that didn't happen and now he's had a red. And um, but look, I mean, he's not been on great form, has he? So I don't think it's the type of loss that it would have been last season. Um, 
you know, he'll come back in inevitably at some point. He'll be whether that be starting or, or on the bench when Van is up. I think that's at the beginning of next month. But um, yeah, he's. I, I think it's not the end of the world. I think you know we've got over Fermi, um, and we have got options in that that deeper role. I, I personally, I don't think Perot playing in the deeper role has has been so good this season. So um, yeah, I, I don't think it's it's a terrible thing. But um, hopefully, it will just give him that you know kick up the backside or you know take him out of the fray for a bit so he can concentrate on his own game for a couple of weeks and um, you know he'll come back and we'll see the parole that we saw more of last year. Yeah, that's the positive slant on it. I'll be honest, I wasn't buying into that positive slant uh, on Saturday because uh, I thought even with um, Piru not uh, at his best, he's still a player that can do something out of nothing and the kind of player that you'd want in games against the likes of Reading and and Cardiff, and I did fear that we would miss him against Reading, but... As it turns out, we didn't. Let's move on from Port Burnley. We've talked enough about that miserable match. Let's go on to Reading, which was anything but that. I mean, pff, Matt, one of the games of the season, I, I'd imagine, for, for Swansea fans, it's very, very rare that you fall down two goals in the two goals to nil in the first half and come back to win a match. Um, for context, the last time Swansea fell two goals down in a game, and came back to win it was back in 2011 away at Middlesbrough. So it's been more than 10 years since we achieved it, but we did it last night. Let's start off with the, the negatives, which is the goals in the first half. I'll be honest, out, coming off the back of a 4-0 defeat away at, Red, at Burnley, to concede two goals that soft, it really did make me think, oh God, what is going on here? I mean, how did you feel when uh, when those goals hit the back of the net? But it was it was hugely frustrating because we dominated. It felt like they hadn't had a sniff in our half, and um, it was one of those things where you just thought, right, we you know we we've got these. They these aren't much you know much cop at all. And um, the first time they go in our half, there's obviously the bouncing ball in the box, which isn't dealt with. It comes back in. There's the save. It gets rebounded back, and, it, and you're just watching it, and you're watching the defenders watch the ball in front of you, and you're thinking, someone, we need to be sharper. We do. Defensively, sometimes I feel like we are almost like they're almost playing like fans. Sometimes they stand there. Sometimes they're almost unsure where the ball's going to go, and you you sometimes need that that leader, that uh, decisive figure. At the back, we've been we've been blessed over the last God knows how many years with the likes of Ashley Williams, Gary Monk, uh, before him, and, and 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 players down the years who would, in those situations, lead by example and stuff. And sometimes we are, we can be accused perhaps of being a little bit too static and not reacting as the ball is moving around the penalty area. Um, they're poor goals. They're both poor goals. The second one I was I was really disappointed with. Um, because we've talked about a step in a way, the change in tact from Russell Martin over the last four or five weeks in terms of um, not messing about with it at the back so much and just getting the job done and letting the midfielders and strikers be in uh, the creative the creative players and let, make sure the defenders primarily are there first and foremost to defend. And then if we can play, make, then all the better. But we've seen a lot less of the... Of the crazy stuff at the back sometimes, which um, which had cost us earlier in the season. So to see the second goal with with Darling, who really just should have dealt with it. Um, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm not buying the. Oh, it was a foul. He's got his hand hands on him. He's got to just deal with it. I mean, you cannot allow that situation to be up to the referee to to get you out of jail because. We know the standard of ref in. Last night was a prime example of the standard <laughs> of ref in in this league. And if you're relying on the ref to help you out, well, it won't happen. It certainly won't also, happen for us. Also, I should point out, you know, we know that at the start of the season, there was this directive that referees were going to tolerate a bit more when it came to fouls. You know, a, a little arm around the side may not be the foul that it was last season, for example. So yeah. I'm not actually convinced by this season's standards that it was a foul. I think it's it's certainly one that could be given... You can make an argument there was one that should have been given, but I don't think it's nailed on a nailed on foul this 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 season. And the bottom line is, Darling was just 
was just too weak on that on that, on that instance. It should never have got that far anyway. And even with, you know, even then, it's he just gets himself into a position where he's very very vulnerable. And of course, it costs us. And unfortunately, with Darling, I think he's been really really good in general of late. But there are just still those little moments of sloppiness. I really he like that Sun- against Sunderland as well, yeah. didn't he? With the last time he played, and he he was, I think, in that game in particular, it was all evident how we changed our tactics because he stood out as the one that was caught maybe dallying on the ball a little bit more than the others, and it was a it was a stark contrast to the other defenders then who weren't being found out in those sorts of situations. He thought, oh, Darling is playing how we all used to play. But now the others have changed and Darling isn't quite there yet. You can see the change, the difference on the pitch in front of you. And yeah, it was disappointing to see him repeat that sort of, um, you know, that slack sort of play um, last night. It was, um, but, you know, we'll talk in a minute how he he made amends, you know, twice over in in, in the rest of the game. But it was just that little moment which uh, he'll he'll learn from and we'll get better from. And uh, we've seen how the team have come on leaps and bounds in their defensive duels and their battles um, over the last five or six games. So he'll get up to speed in no time at all, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I think Darling just needs to cut those out and he'll be a really, really good defender. Everything else is there. He's a fantastic footballer. Just needs to wake up a bit in those situations where he does get caught off guard. Um, other than that, I think he's he's very good, both in his own box and, Steve, in the opposition area. I mean, what a, a vital goal, really, and, and coming at an important time after falling two goals down. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's remarkable. I mean, he hasn't had that much football, really. And he's on three goals. And, I mean, he got 10 goals for MK Dons last year. So, yeah, I mean, if he could sort his defender out, I mean, it'd be the dream, really, wouldn't it, to have this centre-half that is good defensively and that pops up with goals. So, um, yeah, as you say, it was a, a vital goal. And another goal from a corner, which is encouraging. And it was a rare one from a Matt Grimes corner, which like, they really don't happen very often. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a good header. And you look at you know, with it being just before half time, really gave us the momentum that we we sort of needed at that point because, you know, as frustrating as it was to be two one down, I did have a belief that we could come back because I thought the opposition was so bad and they basically only scored from the first two shots, which we'd obviously gifted to them. So, you know, there was no reason from my point of view why we we couldn't come back. Um, and obviously that that proved to be the case, didn't it? Yeah, I I thought I thought we were pretty good in that first half in general. I'll be honest, apart from two very sloppy goals, very frustrating, obviously. But um, I, I thought there was still a lot of good football played by us against a team that was there just to kill kill time and and sit deep and and try to frustrate. Really, um, I'm I'm interested to know what the reaction was like at half time around you because. Um, I've seen a couple of people on Twitter saying that there were some boos, some people who got very angry at, at, at halftime. I'll be honest, around the South Stand, there was nothing around where I was sat. Um, but even Russell Martin mentioned it in his post-match press conference saying that he'd had uh, an angry reaction from the fan um, behind him. Um, what was the reaction around your end of the stadium? Were there any kind of boos, any kind of angry reaction to, at halftime? I- I didn't notice any, Steve. I don't know if you did. No, not really. I mean, I think obviously people were a little bit frustrated, but you know, it was nowhere near at the levels what we've seen in, in some of the previous games. Um, you know, um, there's probably the odd one, wasn't there, that was probably livid. And I think there were a few tweets in there in the, when you look back saying how, how annoyed people were. But, I mean, you've got to judge it sometimes on, on what you've seen, not just necessarily what the the result is. And, and as you say, Gitto, I mean, we weren't, you know, we didn't play especially badly. We we gifted two bad goals, but you know, it wasn't a shocking performance. And I think so the goal before half time probably made the difference. I mean, if, if we hadn't got that, maybe there would have been a few boos, but um, they, they weren't really. I don't think. No, um, I did um, at half time spot one um, Martin out tweet um, from a tweeter who shall uh, remain nameless. And uh, at full time, I went back to check. Oh, you know what uh, what they said, and uh, to, well, that that tweet had been uh, deleted or disappeared somewhere. Um, and, Is this the person uh, that often says stuff like this? Yes, it's somebody who has a uh, <laughs> vendetta. Who are you talking about then? <laughs> Do you I've, possibly? I've got I mean, an idea of who you might be talking about because there this are is a couple. person that is renowned for tweeting certain opinions, and then every time he's made to look wrong, which is very regular, they get deleted. 
I'm not. I, I don't know if we're thinking about the same one, but I mean, I think there are a couple possibly uh, who fit that description. But uh, this one in particular did make me, did make me laugh. Um, but um, I mean, the the bottom line is that that uh, tweet had to be deleted because the Swans really did turn it around in that second half. And let's talk again, Matt, about Ollie Cooper because. I've been just so impressed since he's come in. He's a player that I think we've all been waiting to see for for a long time. A lot of people are saying that he should have been given more of a chance much earlier than than he has. Martin has given him the chance this season. I, and I just think he's made such a big difference. Very small things, really. Main thing is just energy and the buzz that he brings and the fact that he's always looking to make things happen. Uh, he gets us playing on the front foot. And, and I love that. And I guess... It's summed up in the goal because, you know, the cross goes in. It's a good cross. Um, it's flicked on, I think, by um, uh, Kundal, blocked. And the quickest player to react to it is Holly Kupo just throws himself at the ball and smashes it past Joe Lumley before he has any time to, to react, really. Um, and it just, I, I, from that moment on, you're thinking, Fantastic. You know, coming back from two goals down, that's something we definitely definitely don't do too often. And there was enough time to go and get the third. And it just felt like a real momentum swing, having been frustrated for so long in that game. Yeah, and it's about time we get the little breaks like that as well. You know, it's, it's too often you see it, like we, we saw in the first half, a couple of little breaks go the way of um, Reading and they're in the back of our net. So to see something like that come back off the defender and Cooper be able to get his toe on it is, well, it's exactly the sort of goal that can make the difference in this division. I mean, you need to be able to score those sort of scrappy goals, those rebounded goals and and. It, it you know we we probably I certainly criticize we probably all have but I've certainly criticised this in the past of trying to overplay it and 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 trying to create the perfect goal going sideways across the eighteen yard box and and out to the wing and then back inside and and, and not not a lot's happening so it it sometimes is really about get the ball um, in there early before the defence can set themselves and and really pressure them and and it happens to us every week but to see us do the same to the opposition and, and put a bit of pressure on them like you say the flick on gets a little bit of a a, a block in the center of the goal and cooper's there to 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 snuff it into the back of the net and it, it's it's great for him it's great for the swans because as you say he's been such a bundle of energy um i i was going to use and i have used before the kind of raw energy which is, is almost like cuz sometimes you can you can you can coach things out of players when they when they get a bit of experience and they, they kind of lose that edge. Um, but Raw seems a real disservice to him because he's not he's not hugely inconsistent. He's not giving us like a seven out of ten and a three out of ten or anything like that. And you accept it with a territory. He is when he's on the pitch consistently a threat. He's consistently one of our best attackers, and he deserves more credit than perhaps the word Raw. Um, gives him. He's he's certainly a, a a breath of fresh air there for us. And my opinion, and um, and, and I'm sure it's shared by a lot of Swans fans, is is if he isn't knocking on that door for a, for a flight to Qatar, then Rob Page is missing a serious trick here because he's better than some of the um, should we call them make weights, the the good characters that apparently are in line to go, uh, which are not going to offer anything on the pitch. I think you need to be looking at someone young and full of energy who can really make the difference in the tight games and and giving them a spot or at least giving them the opportunity to um to to make their case because he's he's playing at a very high level now and he's doing it on a well every time he steps on the pitch. Well, Steve, what do you think? You're going out to Qatar. Is Ollie Cooper deserving of a place on the plane with you? Yes, I think so. I mean, look at some of the other players that are um that are likely to go. I mean, Johnny Williams is one. I actually like Johnny Williams and I would take him purely because he's somebody that from the bench is likely to make an impact. He will try and make things happen. And you can afford to take a gamble when there's 26. But, I mean, I can. this is a chance to pick on someone like Cardiff, for example. I mean, Ruben Colwell has had nowhere near as good a season as Ollie Cooper, for example. And surely he should go above those two. So, I will yes. stick for Ruben Colwell here and say that for Wales, he, he has tended to play well and he has had an impact for Wales. Maybe, but can't realistically look at what's going on at club level and think that Ollie Cooper doesn't deserve to go, I would say. I mean, if you've got, for any player, surely if they're playing at this level and they're a regular in the team, then it's very difficult to say that they shouldn't be in the squad, I think. So, 
you know, he has made a big impact. And I'm not saying he should play, and he probably won't. But I think he should definitely go. Yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting one. I mean, Rob Page is very, very um, loyal to a lot of um, the players who've been there all along with him. Um, and but but on the other hand, you know, we saw him make some left field um, selections ahead of the Euros in 2022. So I, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but. Um, you know, let's let's see. I think personally, I think he's probably left it a little bit late, but it it wouldn't be a an, a massive you know shock if if he was selected because of the form that he's shown. Another player who is just in incredible form at the moment scored the winner. Steve, I'll go to you on this one. I mean, Jay Fulton, he's been here for so long now. Um, you, you we think we know what he can do. You know, we think we know Jay Fulton inside out. And then he pings a ball into the bottom corner from 30 yards out to complete the comeback. I mean, what what was what was going through your head? What was going through his head as he struck that? Because, you know, it doesn't really make sense to try from that far out, surely. Well, Matt will, will back me up on this. But as I could tell you, it's about to shoot. He would have heard me say the words, don't shoot. And obviously he did shoot and went in. So uh, I got that one completely wrong. Um, he will never he hit uh, a sweeter ball in his life. I wouldn't have thought it was a, it was a screamer. I, I didn't have a lot of faith in him that uh, he was capable of it, although it was going in. But um, that was wrong. It was, a, it was a cracking goal, wasn't it? And obviously a big goal as well, the, the one that's won the game. And um, yeah, one we'll remember for a long time. It must be a very long time since we've come from from two down to uh, to win a game as well. I, I did see someone tweet, it's been 12 years. Yeah. I exactly what game that was, man. It, uh, it was Middlesbrough in 2011. Oh, of course, yeah. The game we won 4-3. Yeah, I remember that now you say it. But yeah, that, that says it all, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's a long time ago. And um, yeah, uh, a, a, a great goal to, to see it, but uh, a very unexpected one as well, wasn't it? Ah, just phenomenal, really. And uh well, uh, one of the things that happened, Matt, after that goal is that it um, it suddenly gave Reading a bit of urgency. Uh, Joe Lumley, in particular, who had been wasting time from pretty much the first second of the game. I, I mean, this this wound me up massively on Tuesday night. It has been so long since I saw a team waste time, try and just kill the game like Reading did from, from the off. Just not not trying to hide it even, just killing it and and just getting away with it as well. A referee who is basically not giving them so much as a warning and just allowing them to to do what they were doing. Joe Lumley, the worst culprit. Um, I, I, what on earth, like the referee was thinking when he was going through all his antics, I have no idea. But uh, I, I'll be honest, it added to the sense of satisfaction at the end where we did get the victory that they, these horrific tactics that they'd employ trying to just kill the game, faking injuries, taking their time of absolutely everything came back to bite them in the ass in the end. And it was so, so hilarious then to see the Swans turn the table, take the piss, quite frankly, with our own time wasting, um, mimicking Reading and then seeing them get frustrated at us doing to them what they had been doing from the first second of the game. It was poetic justice. It was karma. Whatever you want to call it, it was stunning. Yeah, yeah, it was. I think thanks to the Reading Keeper, I'll never watch Absolutely Fabulous ever again. Um, it really did my head in last night. Um, he really was uh, a wind-up merchant straight from the off. Um, there was, uh, I think it was a nudge. Uh, down at the near side, was that, um, I can't remember, it was a joke for a goal kick or something in the first half, and he was straight over to the linesman screaming at him, and I'm thinking, well, hang on you, we're only like five or six minutes into the game and he's been an arsehole already, so he, he became a bit of a pantomime villain, and um, normally that doesn't end well for us, but it was nice last night to see us get the final uh, the final laugh on that one and, um, and, and really uh, piss him off, because there was... Um, there was a funny moment then in the second half when we were in an attack and it was 3-2. <clears throat> I think it was Oko Flex uh, who took a shot um, from 20 plus yards out and he'd actually gone down into the uh, into the South Stand concourse and um, the ball had, had disappeared away down in the stand and um, 
all of a sudden, as you say, Lumley was uh, running around trying to get a spare ball, looking to the halfway line for a replacement ball. Then it eventually made its way back down the stand and then it got hidden behind the hoardings. And his frustration and his immense anger, you could see from the other side of the pitch, and he was just itching to get the ball back in play. And uh, through no fault of anyone, just the, the sheer accuracy on the shot to get it that far away from the pitch was uh, was much to his anger and uh, frustration. But um yeah, he was he was a bit of an arsehole to be honest with you, and he was delighted that we got one over on him, and um, and 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 more, and even again to to see Andy Carroll come on the pitch and us all filled with dread and think, well, here we go, this is this is how the script plays out, and we didn't give him a sniff. We he tried to start a couple of fights and ruffle a feathers. It was quickly snuffed out, and uh, he didn't get a look in, and and that's that's a sign of the sort of maturity. That um, that I was talking about earlier on that we've got to deal with. You know, we've got to be streetwise. We've got to be smart, and we've got to learn how to deal with certain players. Um, one thing, uh, just to go back to what Steve was mentioning earlier about and about the fullbacks, I would like us to see us stop the cross, or at least try to stop the cross more. We I see a standoff crosses so often, and 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 stand back and let the cross and take his pick his pick. And when you've got someone like Andy Carroll in the box, it's it's asking for trouble. Um, but all in all, I thought a defensive display, and, and as I mentioned earlier, Darling as well, really made up for his first half era. Um, Shepard and Tom in South was some brilliant defending in the second half, and he was um, he epitomised the defensive display after the break. Really, we we really kept kept Red in at bay, and even when they were trying to to panic us at three two and trying to force their way back into the game. Um, I thought we held strong, and as you say, Stephen Bender catching a relatively straightforward cross and then crumpling himself in a heap on the floor for 15, 20 seconds. Uh, I think we all enjoyed that, didn't we? The one I really liked was when he took about three run-ups to take the goal kick. That was <laughs> that was pure shit, Hosiery. Absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, Steve, uh, another Reading figure who we all love to hate, uh, Paul Lentz. Um, didn't shake uh, Oberfemi's hand at the end, just walked straight down the tunnel uh, in a very uh, undignified tra- tantrum. And then uh, his post-match interview was hilarious, where he uh, not only claimed that uh, Reading deserved something from that match, which is laughable in itself, but then uh, went on to talk about uh, the need for accountability before blaming absolutely everybody but himself for that defeat, which I found pretty hilarious. I've got to be honest. Um, there, there are. It's one of the things about football, isn't it? A, a victory can taste so much sweeter if it annoys the right people. Yeah, I think so. I mean, let's be honest. Um, look back at Steve Cooper's ring where we had a bit of lucky wins and remember the Stoke win with the dodgy penalty at the end? I mean, that was very satisfying because it was Stoke and they've done this a few times later on and they've been jammed. Uh, Middlesbrough. Yeah, Middlesbrough a couple of games later. Not so much because it was Middlesbrough, but because it was Warnock with a dodgy penalty. Equally as enjoyable. And I think this is sort of similar because I think Paul Lintz is an incredibly arrogant man who has not really achieved a lot in football management. And... Yeah, his comments sort of said it all, really, didn't they? I mean, he's he's, he's delusional. Um, and I think he's very lucky to be in the job that he's in right now. And um, I don't think he'll be in it for uh, a particularly long period of time. So, I mean, how the hell they have had such the start of the season that they had based on last night is baffling. I thought they were appalling. I mean, they're not the worst team I've seen this season, but that's only because Hull were unbelievably bad. So... You know, we're talking about a team here that were 2-0 up and were time-wasting from that moment, really, and were not particularly quick before it. And they just sat deep, you know, for the entire second half. They were asking for trouble. They got exactly what they deserved. And then, of course, like you say, Gitto, the hilariousness of their goalkeeper, who was the right job's worth, wasting time all the time. I mean, I've never seen a man speed up so much uh, since Asmir Begovic, when we played Stoke years ago. And we were um, 2-0 down and then went to 3-2 up on them. And I think he grabbed the ball off a ball boy at one point. So, yeah, um, when you see those type of things, it's very sweet then because, you know, it's it's like an anti-football really, isn't it? And, um, you know, I would say that uh, football injustice was served. Talk about delusion, by the way. Um, I saw a couple of Reading fans have the temerity to claim that the referee was on our side on Tuesday night, which 
I found, I mean, even if you're the most blinkered of fan, I, I mean, you can't possibly believe that kind of nonsense. Um, a referee that allowed Reading to get away with murder with their um, time wasting. Um, they pointed to the penalty claim in the second half, um, which I've looked at every single possible angle and there isn't a single ang- angle that could possibly make that look like a penalty. Stephen Bender off his line quickly, punched the ball away and then clattered into Tom Ince. Um, textbook goalkeeping, absolutely outstanding. And not even Tom Ince appealed for a penalty, which tells you how invalid those claims were and how meritless they were, really. Um, so, yeah, delusion running throughout um, Reading, it seems. Right, let's move on from what was admittedly an absolutely fantastic night uh, at the Liberty to talk about the big one on Sunday. It is a game that used to fill us with a mixture of kind of excitement and tension. You know, you'd look forward to the occasion, but fear what would happen if the the other team won. Am I going too far, Matt, in saying that emotions have have changed going into this fixture over recent years because of the the differing fortunes of both clubs? Um. Yeah, maybe. I think. I, I I don't look. I can't look. I'm what, look. I'm watching the Cardiff game now as we as we talk, and they've been so poor. They have been so poor. And I and I said before we started recording that actually fills me with nerves, <laughs> because you know um, the team talk is 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 not just about the the Swansea game. Then it's about doing themselves justice. It's about they're going to demand a reaction. A lot of Cardiff fans said a couple of weeks ago that this was going to be the the Mark Hudson job interview, the, the, the Cardiff game. There's so many Cardiff managers that have gone by in the past and not got it and not got the team up, played it down as another three points on the table and that's played into our hands. Now, there's such a talk after the Steve Morrison um, debacle last year that, at, at, the, at the Cardiff City Stadium where he did it after the game, which was rubbing salt into already sore wounds for Cardiff fans. That um, that they've made it completely clear that they need to see a reaction. They need to see a manager now with a different view on it, and you know that will have been made abundantly clear to Mark Hudson. So I'm sure his message is going to be something different to managers before. So um, I don't think the nerves subside. Obviously, the double's done. That's the biggest thing in the in the in the in the meeting in the South Wales derby history, um, and it's been it's been achieved now. Uh, it's incredibly important that we don't let them do it the straight away the season after, after waiting 110 years for us to get it. Um, and I'm still nervous, excited, and, and filled with the emotions of the derby. And I'm, I'm sure we all, I'm sure we all are, are feeling the same way. I do get what you're saying that, um, that 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 we've had a lot of the positive results. Um, I just, I'm just nervous about resting on any laurels. I always feel like we're better. Um, when Cardiff are cocky, when Cardiff believe that they're the better team. And right now, it's not too many in Cardiff that I think feel that way. And they, they know they're in a, a moment of transition and um, and they're really struggling to make a click at the moment. So um, I, I, I would say beware the wounded beast, you know, and we need to make sure that we're on it on Sunday because it's a derby day and form goes out the window. Steve, how do you think we'll approach this game? Because we are probably going to be stronger favourites for this derby than we've been for any derby in a while, I would imagine. I mean, we're going into this game on the back of, um, was it five wins in six games? Uh, a really morale-boosting win against Reading uh, in midweek. Cardiff, on the other hand, are going, well, it, the game's not over yet, but it looks like they're going to lose a, a second straight game. Uh, one of them was against the bottom team of the division. Uh, this one has been an absolute battering, really, against QPR, um, where they've been down to 10 men from very, very early on. Um, so very different fortunes for both teams. Do, do you think that changes the dynamic in any way that, especially after you know our recent performances in the, in the, um, in the derby, there's going to be a greater level of expectation on the Swans going into this one? Yeah, there, there could be, because obviously we've been very spoiled in this fixture, haven't we? I mean... The aggregate in the last seven games is 13 to 1. The one was scored for Cardiff behind closed doors. So in a couple of weeks, it'll be nine years since Cardiff saw their team score a derby goal against us. I mean, you know, for them, it's been misery, hasn't it? And obviously for us, it's been glorious. So, you know, I mean, but 
that doesn't mean it's going to carry on that way. So we just, you know, we have enjoyed it over the last few years, but got to approach this game as the same way that we always do with the Cardiff game is that, you know, it's it's there for us to win, but we can't be complacent and, and expect it. I mean, and I think that's why we, we have done so well. And it maybe that, and obviously I think it's always, to be fair, drilled into the, the team, how important it, it is to us and what it means. And I think every manager has always really bought into it as well. So, you know, we've been fortunate in that sense. And maybe for the, for Cardiff, it's not been the case. And, you know, obviously they've, they've struggled. So, look, I think it's just more of the same from our point of view. We Obviously, we, we did exceptionally last year to win both games so convincingly and complete the dube for the first time. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, though, the most important Cardiff fixture will always be the next one. So we enjoyed that. It's part of history. But we want to do it again on Sunday. So we need to make sure we're at it. And, and if we are, we've, we've got a good chance of, um, of getting a good result again. I wonder if that dube flag is going to make a reappearance. That'll be interesting to see. Um, I mean, Matt, is there something to be said about the fact that this Cardiff squad that's going to be arriving uh, at the Liberty on Sunday is going to be a very, very different one to the one last year? It's gone through major change in the summer, not yeah. just in terms of personnel, but they have tried to change the style as well. Um, you know, it's it's a very different Cardiff team. They have got better technical footballers now than they did before with, with you know, they're all, the previous teams were all giant brutes who tried to physically bully you. Cardiff are going to come here to, to play football. Um, and and they, they, they've they shown, you know, I know tonight they've they've been blown away by QPR, really, and the fact they've been down to 10 men has definitely contributed to that. But they've shown in, in the pa- in the past this season that they can be, you know, very tough and very resilient. I mean, they've they've got wins against uh, they beat Norwich one uh, nil at the start of the season. They've beaten Blackburn one nil, who are top of the league as we as we record this. Um, you know, they, they've been able to frustrate some teams who are above us in the table this season. Do, do you fear that you know the the kind of the, the stink of failure from previous derbies won't be quite as strong with this Cardiff team. Yeah, but they're also missing. I mean, look, I'm not going to profess to have watched every Cardiff game this season. No one needs to do that. No one's put themselves through that torture. But um, they, I, I feel like they've, they've brought in a lot of freebies from all over the country and tried to rebuild on a budget. And and I, I thought, and the early few games of the season, I did watch them. I thought, well, Credit to Steve Morrison for trying that and trying to change them from a hoofball team into something with a bit more football in Nelson trying to play the right way. And I thought, well, I was shocked that they that they got rid of him, to be honest with you. Um, but what I would say is, are they are they now lacking those characters that that would get it? You know, even even well, particularly the pricks, to be honest with you. The Aiden Flints, the Sean Morrisons. Do you know what I mean? Those sorts of complete arseholes you love to hit. And in years gone by, you had the Bothroids, the Chopras, the Ledleys. Um, they were the ones you just thought, oh, they could only play for Cardiff. And I, I extend that motion to Morrison and Flint and and, and the like. We just think they they just horrible people, horrible characters, horrible footballers. And um and yeah, and those characters were often um you know the ones that would really be up for it and really try and uh, and get under your skin on derby day and 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 I wonder if that is perhaps going to be missing from their team this time round you know they're going to have that um that sort of nastiness about them um cuz if it is just a game on if you take emotion out of it uh, which is impossible on Derby Day. I don't need to tell you to that. But if you took the emotion out of it and played it on a technical game of football, you'd have to say that seven, eight times out of ten, we're winning this one because we are a much more settled unit. We've on a, a cracking run of form. We we know what we're doing. We haven't just changed our managers. We haven't got a whole influx of players in the summer that are trying to bed in. There's a hundred reasons, but there is the emotion. They, and you, it'd be interesting to see uh, how it does impact them, but I, I'm sure it will in some way. Whether they use that to their advantage or not, I'm sure we're going to find out. Mm, and uh, you know, Steve, if there's one area where I think, you know, you look at Swansea's recent run, you say, well, there are still clear weaknesses there. I, I'd suggest that it's at the back where I think there's been some improvement, but it's still not entirely uh, watertight. I mean, we've conceded ten goals in the in the past five games. We haven't kept a clean sheet since the uh, Hull game. 
Um, and there have been some some silly mistakes at the back. Does that worry you? Because you know Cardiff, in fairness, they've got they don't score many goals, but they have got players who can um, find the back of the net. The likes of Callum Robinson, Ojo to a lesser degree. Callum O'Dowd is a bit of a Jamie Patterson type of player who can come up with moments of magic every now and again. Um, you know they've they've got players who can find the back of the net. Um, does it does it concern you at all that? the defence is struggling to keep clean sheets at the moment. Well, yeah, I think it has to, because you look at last night as being the prime example. I mean, really not for nothing, but managed to get two goals. So that does concern me that we still give away cheap goals. And obviously Burnley scored a few cheap ones against us as well. So yeah, recently we have started conceding more again over the last few games. So I mean, there's always going to be an element of fear as well. We're playing Cardiff. So I know as much as we've got this good record, we still know that when you're playing there, you've got to be at it because it's a derby game and, you know, we, you've just got to be at your best. So, look, we, we could hurt ourselves. You, you don't know. We could could dominate and find ourselves behind because defensively, I don't trust us entirely. So, look, but we've got to be thinking more about ourselves I think, and thinking about what we can do to the opposition. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the, the last time both teams scored in the South Wales derby was uh, April 2010, the uh, the Michael Chopra derby, um, which which feels like a very long time ago. First goal scorer, all important in this match. And Matt, who do you think are the, the important players going into this game? Who are the ones that you are looking to in the Swans team to make the difference? Um, oh, sorry. It's going to be... I think it's, it's this one is 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 going to be if we can control midfield, um, which I think at the moment the form of Jay Fulton in particular has been a massive a, you know improvement and, and such a surprise I think to a lot of fans who thought his days were numbered in the summer. Um, so to to see that kick on, I think we need to nullify that threat. I am concerned about the the aerial threat and whether or not that's going uh the long ball and the ball into the box, that kind of thing where we, we can make um mistakes and stuff at the back. But I think with Cardiff now, we can control the ball. We've seen over the last um the last year in particular where we control the ball in midfield, we control the game and we don't give them a sniff. And and you know to go seven nil last year is a testament to how you can just Take the take their threat out, like it's almost taking the sting out of the bee. You know, they they just become this limp little pathetic creature that has got no bite, nothing, no no sting, no no harm to them. And I think our best games come when we against them when we can dominate the midfield and just keep them chasing the ball for ninety minutes. So there are some big characters that are out of the team at the moment. If we need to get, if we can get Ryan Manning back on the pitch, that immediately improves us in defence and attack, because he's just as much bigger threat at the other end of the pitch, of course. Um, the question marks surrounding Jamie Patterson and Joe Allen. I don't know if either or both might feature at some point on Sunday. Uh, it, it, he seems to be asked about at every press conference, Russell Martin, and he's he's hinting that one or two players are likely to be back. So speculation now of who those players are. We expect Manning will be one. Um, but does, Jamie is... Patterson, does Jamie Patterson actually exist? Or is he a figment of my imagination? <laughs> well, since about November last year, I think you've got a valid point, really, of what, what, whether he does. But um, I think this time round, um, for him to come back into the fold, even if he gets a bench place on Sunday, just before, well, for the Cardiff game and then Bristol a week after, of course, a former club of his, um, I'm sure he'll be moving heaven and earth in training and in the fitness room and whatnot to try and make, prove that he's ready for these two games. Um, he loves a Cardiff game, Jamie Patterson, as we know. Um, he's been influential for us in them, and I think he could um, he could be on the bench. I, I do feel like he could be on the bench for this one. It, it feels like it's been steadily building towards that. Um, but then it would only be the bench, because I think it would be incredibly harsh to look at that midfield, uh, Grimes, Fulton, Cooper, and look at them and think, right, one of you's not good enough, one of you's got to step out of this team, because um, they were all giants last night again, and um, they, that, that three, if they're fit, 
and ready pick themselves. And one thing I will say before you pass it over here is, is that bench is going to look really strong, and it has done for a lot of games this season. That's the big difference to me this season is we've got we'll have the likes of Cham, love him or hate him, and I know there's a big divide on Cham. Um, <laughs> you know, is a the, there is strength in depth on that bench, and uh, we've we've you know we've benefited from it already this season with our comeback wins. I think it's ten points from losing yeah. positions this season is almost unheard of in Swansea colours. The most in the championship from losing positions, which is mad. We are usually, you know, the wrong end of those types of results. Um, so that's that's a fantastic turnaround, really. I mean, Steve, who are the players that you are looking to? And, and what are there any kind of changes that you would make to that Reading team ahead of um, the Cardiff match? What would be your ideal team realistically with the players who are likely to be fit? It's a good question, really. I mean, from we all have to hope that Ryan Manning is fit, and if he's if he is, he's coming straight in, isn't he? And Sora Nola will go back to the other side. Um, I think Norton might come in for Darling. That wouldn't be a shock. Um, then the front players, I think, will probably remain the same. I mean, Joe Allen, we, we don't know obviously what the situation is with him. I think it's unlikely that he would start, but you never know. He could be fit enough for the bench. So that would obviously be a welcome return. Um, but I do think that Cundell and Cooper will will keep their places. I can't see Cham coming into the team and starting. So, you know, the, but we do have options from the bench. He's, he's one, for example, then. So, but yeah, I, I don't think we're going to see too many changes, but it's Manning is the big one, really, if he's fit. Yeah, I think a lot of fingers crossed for Manning. I just think he makes such a difference when he plays, he, you know, even against Reading. I think we could have really used just his energy and the cutting edge um, and, and both defensively and in attack. He's just been so good this season. Um, I, I, I'd really like to see Cooper and Kendall keep their place for this game. I think, I know, and Cham's, you know, improved slightly of late and he's he's got some goal involvement, but I, I, I still think he's an unreliable player and I, I, I still think his general performances aren't as good as what, um, Cooper and Kendall are giving us at the moment so that I'd love to keep those two together I'd like to see Darling ke- um, keep his place um, I think he has been good apart from those sleepy moments and I'd like to see us persevere with him um, but uh, like you said I, I'm not convinced that Norton's going to be kept on the bench just because Martin is very very keen to use him but I mean a big player as well, Obafemi I think we saw against Reading even though he didn't score and even though he was quite quiet for much of the game he has this explosiveness. He has this energy and this speed that can just cause problems. And and he's willing to come back and and defend as well. But I, you know, when when we're attacking, to have that kind of player who can just make that run and and terrify defenders, it does go a long way. He hasn't got the goals that we expected him to have so far this season. But I, I still think he's got the potential to be, you know, a really big player in this kind of game. So um, I'm just gonna. Oh, sorry, Dora will say on Obafemi as well, just before we go, in to say that um, he's that exact sort of character I was talking about. He will be well up for this. You know, he's, it's cost him. It's cost him with the Swans fans earlier in the season. We don't need to go over those events now, whatever. But he he plays with his heart on his sleeve. He, he plays with it on his, in the palm of his hand sometimes. You can see his emotion etched everywhere, all over his body. So he's a man who will certainly be absolutely buzzing to be out there and might be secretly... Uh, smiling that um, Pirro's on a three-match ban, knowing he's going to get the minutes that uh, he wants on the pitch on Sunday. He's um, he's going to be gagging for it, and he, he did well last year, so he's going to uh, he's going to want to repeat that. He loves winding people up as well, doesn't he? So you know, to wind the opposition up in this kind of match, I mean, he'd, he'd love it. it. It would just be it would just be bliss, wouldn't it, if um, if he was to score? I can I can see it now. Um, I mean. It's going to be very difficult to top um, last year's derbies because they were just so incredible. But um, I think, look at the way the Swans are playing at the moment. There is every reason for us to be hopeful. But make no mistake, you know, there is every potential for this to be a very difficult game. And uh, it wouldn't take much to turn the atmosphere nervy on Saturday. So um, hopefully we can give Cardiff the usual welcome that we that we always give them at the Liberty Stadium. Just before we go, boys, I want to ask you what, what your plan is for Sunday in general and, and what are your emotions leading up to this game? Um, Matt, I'll start with you. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't 
I don't tend to think about it until um, the day because I years gone by I have and it is just you know it it, it just makes you go like it'll feel a bit obviously before the double and uh, it makes you feel a little bit sick in the mouth and you just oh god like, I almost wish this day would pass and I just knew the result because it's not one you really want to sit through and go through the trauma and the, the terror of watching that on a knife edge but um, but when when the day comes then it obviously starts with. The excitement, the giddy excitement, doesn't it? And then everyone's going to be getting up early to get ready to get out because obviously it's an early kickoff on Sunday and you have that kind of anticipation then, which uh, that excitement and nerves puts that knot in your stomach, doesn't it? And you get out as soon as the pubs will let you. And you get out and you get the first beer in and uh, it goes down remarkably quickly and um, it doesn't settle the nerves like some beers do but it adds to the fun of the day and it makes you want to um, enjoy it more and more doesn't it so I'm sure uh, there'll be thousands in the same boat who want to get out and and, and, and absorb the day as much as they can um, before the game and um, it'll be one you need to leave about 10-15 minutes earlier than normal to get to the stadium because it's going to be packed to the rafters and um, people are going to be well up for it. I know Cardiff have, uh, have sold out, which is, a, which is a welcome change for them uh, to sell out the game. I don't know what they know what that's like, but uh, they, um, they, they sold out their end as well. So it promises to be an electric atmosphere. Um, and being uh, an early kickoff on a Sunday, uh, it allows plenty of time for celebrations if it all goes well afterwards, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed indeed. What about you, Steve? I mean, what are your emotions leading up into this game? Um, emotions. I, I think the, the nerves are sort of starting now that we know it's um, it's the next game. So, yeah, it'll probably get worse the next few days. I don't usually sleep great the night before a derby, if I'm honest. Uh, a lot of nerves and, and excitement. Um, I am going for breakfast in town in the morning. And I should be in the railway by 10 o'clock. That's my plan. I know one or two of the plan in seven or eight o'clock in the railway, but um, that's just a, a little bit too far, I think. Uh, I would be in a ridiculous state by lunchtime if that happened. So uh, I think 10 o'clock's uh, a bit more sensible. There we go. Well, whatever your plans for the derby, hope you enjoy it and hopefully we'll have something to celebrate at the end of it. We've become accustomed to winning in this match now and accustomed to superiority in this fixture. Hopefully it will continue beyond this weekend. So come on the Swans and get us another big derby win. Until next time, thank you very much for listening.